It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Keith James. Keith has a PhD from University of Wales in Aberystwyth. He's worked for much of his career as an oil company geologist. He's an honorary department fellow at the Institute of Geography and Earth Sciences at the University of Wales. Keith is an expert on the geology of the Caribbean in particular. He's not going to talk on that subject tonight. He contests the popular theory that the Caribbean originated in the Pacific. Although Keith has worked as an oil company geologist for much, much of his life and is now a consultant geologist, um, he's found time to write a good number of scientific papers, including several dozen, um, which he's published in the last 20 years. Tonight, he's going to lecture us on the subject of plate tectonics at 50, not written in stone, where he'll describe his uh, ideas that uh, plate tectonics needs to be revised. So um, that's a very intriguing title. And uh, Keith, uh, thank you very much for um, lecturing us tonight. My name, Keith James. Plate tectonics at 55, not written in stone. This talk will include the following topics. Okay, so several different topics, and uh, it will appear that I jump I jump around quite a bit as I change uh, the topic. But I hope at the end of the presentation you'll get a flavour of of what I'm talking about. That there's a lot wrong with the theory of plate tectonics. Just as a matter for information, the the guys who were involved in the development of plate tectonics in the middle of the 60s they had tremendous enthusiasm and collaboration between the United Kingdom and the, and the United States. And this reference is a book, and it contains some fascinating talks about the those participants. So it, if you're interested, do look it up. But while those talks were, those interesting ideas were surfacing in the middle of the 60s, Belousov wrote the following. He cautioned that Confident talk about a revolution in earth science can lead to a long period of confusion. And what happened? Today we have lots of textbooks and YouTube lectures that repeat the message of the 60s with little update. And paradigm has become dogma. According to the US Geological Survey, a tectonic plate is a massive, irregularly shaped slab of solid rock. What's massive? Are plates irregularly shaped? And PT theory explains how mountains and oceans formed. Are the explanations correct? We know that we have continental plates, which are granitic and quartz rich. We have oceanic plates, which are made of basalt and they contain much uh, less silica and oceanic plates since they're composed of basalt, is this properly understood? Here are the, uh, the 12 to 13 plates that are classically understood. But the focus is on spreading ridges, uh, volcanic arcs, and collision zones. And these are the recognized plates. According to this author, Transform faults define plate boundaries, and many transforms cross the continents. There are many more plates than 12 to 13. Here I have just sketched across that uh, previous diagram these, these lines crossing Eurasia and Africa, just to show that there are many, many plates. Okay, jump now to continental drift. We all know that our friend uh, Wegener introduced this. He, he observed that the coastlines of Africa and uh, Eurasia matched very well with the Americas. And then he postulated those continents had separated. And so we have his contribution. South America and Africa separated at, uh, at 120 million years. And the mechanism 
according to Wegner, was centrifugal force. According to Hess, we'll see shortly, it's due to seafloor spreading. And according to Holmes, it involves convection cells in the mantle. In the early days of plate tectonic evolution, when we were talking about the evidence for continental drift, paleontology, right, very importantly, it, we see the, uh, these examples. And it's a shame that today paleontology is not given its proper importance, recognition. South Atlantic opened at 120 million years, Yet today we find fossils show interchange between Africa and South America in the Eocene. And plate tectonic papers do not address this problem. This is a fish, a freshwater fish, first seen in the Eocene. It's present in Africa and South America, identical species with identical parasites. The catfish. Also fresh water appeared in South America and then in the Cenozoic in these countries. And the manatee, for example, fresh water again, appeared in the Eocene in these countries. How did they cross the ocean? Well, of course, they went across, they rafted across the South Atlantic, or they jumped across on islands. Turning to Hess and seafloor spreading, he proposed that this carried continents apart, and it's the result of convection cells in the mantle, and uh, currents rise to mid-oceanic ridges, spread laterally, and descend into trench subduction zones. So here's the diagram. By the way, I've, a lot of these diagrams I've taken from a textbook who kindly gave me their permission when I told them that I was using it for teaching. So these are the convection cells. So the convection cell rises it, to the mid-oceanic mid ridge and then it descends at a trench where it generates volcanic arcs. This diagram is only two dimensional and we need to look at things in three dimensions or, or four dimensions. Where the spreading plate descends at the trench, we have a mechanism called slab pull and another mechanism for driving spreading is ridge push. Well, slab pull is a non-starter. If we have no spreading, we have no slab to pull. And if we have no slab pull, we have no spreading. This is a rich push drive spreading. This is a seismic section over an oceanic plate. It reveals quite clearly an extensional basin. And extension cannot push. This is a, a, a fracture zone, and fracture zones can offset the spreading ridges up to thousands of kilometers. So let's look at a convection cell and another convection cell offset by a thousand kilometers. And we have a, across the fracture zone, we have the unlikely situation that this cell is going down while well, this cell across the fracture zone is coming up. And I don't believe that is credible. Looking now at Pangaea, this is the classic portrayal of Pangaea. It suffered early Triassic breakup because of crustal extension. So these are some diagrams illustrating the plate tectonic situation, plate tectonic evolution, and the arrows indicate motions of the plates at different times. And I asked the question, in these reconstructions, which are beautiful, how could directions change so radically? We have a slide here which illustrates the relationship between North America and South America and shows <laughs> convergence. 
But that's not true because in between those two continents, we have a large area, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, which clearly is very much extending. So there's no convergence. We turn now to the Pacific plate where we see the Hawaii Emperor Seamount chains. Prof. Fulcher has uh, suggested that these are tears in pre existing structures, and I very much agree with that. These authors noted that of 25 Pacific chains, almost all are not consistent with hotspot theory. Belusov wrote, it's my old friend Belusov, he's a Russian if you didn't know. Some Pacific volcanic islands formed in the Eocene and Miocene and are still active. And since they formed, Pacific crust must have moved these amount of kilometers. And so he asked the question, how are those volcanoes still asked? A very rational quest question. Here we see the Hawaii Emperor Seamount chain and on the island of Oahu, 2.3 million years old, but it produces proterozoic zircons. And I haven't seen anybody explain that. I'll turn to zircons because they're very important. We'll talk about them later. Earth's crystal fabric. In order to discuss that, I look out into space. And we see the mares on the moon and the, the craters. If you ask most people, what shape are the craters on the moon? They will tell you they are circular, but in fact, they are hexagonal. So looking more at the hexagon, this is the Rosetta Comet, the golden asteroid. More examples of hexagons. I'll flip through these very quickly. This is a fascinating one. This is the North Pole of Saturn. And there's this giant hurricane with margins of about 14,000 kilometers. And it's a clear hexagon. We see hexagon also in the buckyball. We also see pentagons because you need, you need to have those together with the hexagons on a globe. Quartz and feldspar crystals are common crystal minerals, as we know. So is olivine, the most common mineral on Earth. There's a thin section of olivine. And lastly, those of us who are of nervous disposition, this is um, aragonite, which increases energy and boosts self-confidence. I have a crystal of that here for... <laughs> For, for, for her to help me. So the question is, why is the hexagon such a common feature? If you remember, the US Geological Survey said plates are irregular in outline, but we'll see that they are not. The hexagon is such a, a common feature because least energy is involved when sides meet at 120 degrees on a spherical surface. And long ago, people noted that the Earth's crust was divided into polygonal blocks. They are not as the US Geological Survey discusses them. Moody noted that many faults, fractures, and lineals are wrench faults. And I'm going to emphasize the importance of these later in a shear pattern that segments the crust. Notice this, many vertical faults decide, define polygonal blocks with different geological histories. Now, I think this is a much better definition of plates than the US Geological Survey. This is a fascinating map. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, it was published in the year 2007. It's a magnetic map of the world. And I just want to emphasize by the way, you can buy this. It's about 10 euros uh, um, a sheet, and I recommend you have it. It's fascinating to study. But just notice the, the patterns on this map. You see this 
very intense pattern here and here. These are cratons. And then south of this line here, which is the Tornquist line, you see a totally different pattern, which is extended continent. In the middle of the map, we see striped oceanic crust. We'll talk about that in a while. And then we see these extensions off here, off South America and Africa, which are, according to plate tectonics, they are the Cretaceous when quiet period, when the Earth forgot to reverse its polarity during a period of 40 million years. But in fact, this shares the same signature as the adjacent crust, and it is extended continent. So looking at this map here, it's a part of that, that Cohonan map, with Africa and North America, in the, in the middle is the striped crust, and on the edges we have what I call, I'm saying now, is extended and submerged continental crust. In this area of eastern North America, there are these fracture zones, shown here is again. And those fracture zones go on into North America. And uh, North America, you can see the outline of the coast here. And this is the Appalachian system. And the fractures offset the Appalachian system. And they controlled the deposition, these are isopacks of Ordovician Cambrian carbonate rocks. So these fractures are ancient. They are at least Paleozoic and uh, in uh, I have evidence that in other parts of North America, they are Proterozoic. I want to turn now to fractal geology, what I call fractal geology. Here's an anticline in Wales. There's the anticline. If we stand on top and look down at the anticline, we see fractures. We see fractures opening and we see crystal collapse. Here are, the, here are the fractures, and notice they have a particular pattern. This is the Mid-Atlantic Rift exposed in Iceland. And we see once again this pattern. This is the East Africa Rift Valley, it's anticlinal. And once again, this pattern, but on a much larger scale. We can turn to the Red Sea. Once again, the same pattern. The west coast of Africa. The same pattern. And so what I'm saying is that patterns of fractures, the fractures we've just seen, they exist at all scales, many scales. And I call that fractal geology is it's, it's quite fascinating. Let's turn to Earth's magnetic field. Its polarity is seen to flip. And that is used by people who look at the seafloor spreading. They say that the stripes on the seafloor actually re record flips in Earth's magnetic polarity. So we see in this diagram how that occurs has spreading crust records the polarity active at the time the spreading ridge generated. When I look at diagrams, I see high intensity and low intensity. I'm not inventing this, this is it's a published diagram. This is Open University looking at Red Sea magnetic profile. And once again, it's high to low intensity. It's not talking about reversal. Vine and Matthews were the champions of the seafloor linear magnetic anomalies. And they said that they are due to geomagnetic field reversals. But they used in their paper, they spoke about high intensities alternating with low intensities. They also said in their paper, and you will not read this in modern work that quotes uh, these authors, that the magnetic contrast could be 
explained without reversals of Earth's magnetic field by presence of strongly magnetized material adjacent to weakly magnetized material. And we'll revisit this topic shortly. Magnetic stripes are, are calibrated only on Iceland for the last 4 million years. But they are, there's 4 million years, they are extrapolated to 84 million years, a factor of 20 times. In the South, they're ex extrapolated in the South Atlantic and uh, where we see 34 magnetic stripes to the west of the spreading ridge. But interestingly enough, we have, if you look at the Pacific, there are 54 magnetic stripes. So if, if 34 magnetic stripes indicate 84 million years, I ask how many years do the 57 in the South Pacific record? Hertzler was the man who made this, this extrapolation. He cautioned, quite rightly, the possible error in extrapolation cannot be over emphasized and if Sabine and Matthew's theory we've just looked at is in error the conclusions of his paper do not apply but you do not see this resurrected in discussions of uh, modern plate tectonic papers. Here's a simple uh, other technique that people use to identify the age of magnetic stripes on the seafloor. And here we have older sediment and here we have younger sediment. And so using the age of the sediments on top of the seafloor does not calibrate what is subcropping. It's a natural progression that not, does not date the underlying rocks. The deep sea drilling program has over the, over the world aimed at a reaching oceanic crust the basalt of oceanic crust. 153 sites that reached it were called basement, but 19 had baked sediments above the basalt and therefore their intrusions, their sills. Some were younger than the surrounding sediments, again they are sills, and some contain sedimentary clasts, so there's an underlying section and the basalts tested by the DSDP are not spreading basement. Okay, I'm turning now to the basin and range province of North America. We see these listric faults soling out at about 20 kilometers, and they are an extensional regime. Up those faults come igneous rocks. So if we look now at the seismic section I showed earlier of our oceanic uh, crust, we see basins on, on the seafloor and they are 60 to 200 kilometers wide, similar to the dimensions of magnetic stripes. And what we are looking at is extension. This is a, a geological cartoon of North East Africa, where we have continent, gradually becoming extended towards the ocean, thinner and thinner towards the ocean, its extension. And we have to answer what is causing this extension. Kind of very bright person, I love his work. He's, he described, discussed thinning of continental passive margin, followed by rupture, involving extension up to hundreds of percent. And it forms zones very wide with organized magnetic anomalies from serpentinization. What is serpentinization? Well, mantle peridotite in the ocean at less than 500 degrees centigrade reacts with water and changes into serpentinite. Notice the difference in density plus magnetite. The volume increase is as much as 45%. It's phenomenal. And heat is liberated. Picture of a rock, got to do that for now and again. And uh, serpentinite, this is magnetite. This is a black smoker 
on the ocean floor, where chemosynthesis takes place using sulfur instead of oxygen, and it's a possible site for the origin of life. If I look at the sea floor wedge that I showed just a moment ago and put a series of these alongside each other, then igneous rocks will rise up the extensional fault. So we have, we can expect to see serpentinite and magnetite along this extending margin. And the intensity over this geometry will range from high intensity to low intensity. Let's come back to the coherent that magnetic map that we saw <clears throat> earlier on. You can see here beautifully the coastline of Africa and South America. And then we see these large provinces in the adjacent ocean. And these are, as I said before, they are areas of extended and subsided continental crust. And so Pangaea was 50% larger than is generally spoken about. If we remove those magnetic stripes, we have a great fit between the two continents. And it was across this fit that dinosaurs and the other fossils we saw earlier migrated directly without drafting and without island topping. All the red dots on this slide indicate ancient rocks on the dredged or pested on the Atlantic Ocean floor. Look at the ages of these. It's just to point out that uh, there's a lot of continental crust, ancient rocks on the seafloor. A lot of these samples are actually locked up in the Smithsonian Institute and, and forgotten about. But recently, the Brazilians who are very, they have a lot of oil uh, here, they were very interested in the offshore. They dredged and found uh, granite on the Rio Grande rise of this age. And the Japanese went there and actually filmed it with a, uh, using a submarine. This is Zealandia, Australia here, New Zealand here, and in between, apart from New Zealand, a lot of extended and subsided continental crust. And it has been nominated as continent number eight, Zealandia, which broke away from Australia in the late Cretaceous. It was a pathway for biodispersal in the South Pacific. Prof Fulger nominated a new continent, Icelandia, and proposed that we should also look at these other candidates. And I think they are quite very reasonable. If you get that map, that magnetic map, you can see for yourselves many, many candidates in the, in the oceanic realm of the world. No wrote about the Lost Pacifica continent. All right, turning now to the size of the Earth. The USGS uh, map showing the spreading ridges around the world, total length, There are 30,500 kilometers of trenches where they're consumed, 9,000 kilometers of collision zones where they're consumed, total 39,500 kilometers. More crust generated than consumed. Earth is expanding. Cluster two satellites sent up by the European Space Agency study the Earth's magnetosphere. They detect large amounts of electrons and protons in the solar wind. And the Earth's magnetic field propels these into the Earth. And over hundreds of millions of years, Earth's mass increases. If the mass increases, so does the volume. And 
just to look at in uh, these statistics at 500 million years ago, we had 424 days per annum. We can determine that by looking at growth increments in fossils. Today, 365 days, Earth's rotation is slowing just as a ballerina who's spinning extends her arm sideways, she slows. Earth expansion, slower rotation, Earth grows and slows. So here's the expanding Earth. This is an original size, and here's a later size, with the continents dispersed. They are separating, but they are not separating circumferentially, they're separating radially. This is a book that I have alongside me, as a matter of fact. If you really want to tax your spare time, try to read it. The question I have is, would the Wilson cycle of oceans opening and then closing work on a, an expanding Earth? satellite gravity of the Atlantic Ocean, we have fractures which cross offset the spreading ridges. And here, the same hero Wilson noted that here we have the direction of spreading here and the direction of spreading here, this way and this way, but in between there's a contradiction. The arrows are, are opposite in there in their sense of disposition. And he labeled this as a new class of transformed faults. But if the ridges are moving apart in this direction, then such faults do not exist because the motion is, uh, is maintained. Here we're looking at uh, triple junctions. Uh, they are where spreading ridges meet. And if you think about it, a triple junction, if this, this is a triple junction, this is spreading in this direction and in this direction, then we have a space problem. And triple junctions can only exist on an expanding Earth, but they do exist. This is a, a picture of the, the view of the South Pole, and we see Antarctica. And you might ask yourself, what shape is Antarctica? Here we have original situation for triple junctions, which have now moved apart. And the spreading ridges, they're migrating away from Antarctica. All continents are moving north away from Antarctica. They must be separating. And the ridge here must be extending. And so the channels up which the magma ascends also must migrate. And this needs to be explained by plate tectonics. I don't have an explanation for it. My own thought is that we're, that these spreading ridges are very shallow affairs and nothing to do with deep convection currents. This is a very interesting diagram. It's a geological map of the world. And there's that ridge that goes all the way around Antarctica. But there are four spreading ridges, the major ridges, there's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there's the East Pacific. There are four ridges and they are dispersed at precisely 90 degrees from each other. And uh, I don't uh, fully understand that. It may be that we're talking, it's controlled by extension on a rotating, expanding Earth. I want to turn my attention to andesites. And according to the USGS, subduction results in volcanic arcs. They also note that interoceanic arc andesite has the same composition of continental rocks. And so I say, so what's so obvious from that relationship? But the question is, where does silica come from? Cannot come from basalt, it's not enough silica. So we look at models, we say that silica comes from subducting sediments, it comes from subducting oceanic crust, it 
arises from interaction with the mantle or fusion of the mantle. There are many models, nobody knows. Andesite, abundant in intraoceanic volcanic arts, but it's typical of continents. Cannot derive from basalt, therefore we have an andesite problem. It must be new continental crust, which forms in subduction factories. That's the theory. Let's turn to look at zircons for a while. It's an extremely resistant mineral. It once formed, it, it lives forever. It just grows. But the isotope ratios in the crystal can be dated. And recent zircon dating in these locations All these are volcanic arcs in the Western Pacific. I'll show you a map of those now. But until recently, they were seen as intra-oceanic with new continent. Why new continent? Because you see, you see on seismic section, you see continental velocities below the islands. But these ancient zircons, they all produce ancient zircons. All these islands produce ancient zircons, which show the presence of original continental crust. Here are the islands. They're all being dispersed towards the east by back arc spreading. And they are quite often arcuate, and they are radiating over the adjacent Pacific crust. The Lesser Antilles, this is my stamping ground, the Caribbean and South America. Here are the Lesser Antilles. Here's Venezuela, Colombia, Venezuela, Trinidad. But on these islands, Barbados, we'll look at again later, there are the Precambrian and Paleozoic zircons have been discovered, the same as these islands in the Western Pacific. Also, these islands are being dispersed to the east, radial dispersal towards the east. I'm going to look at a cross section here, velocity section. There's the actual volcanic arc. This section goes all the way out to Barbados. And this is a 10 kilometer thick layer of continental velocities. So the Lesser Antilles. Famous for having the most continental crust-like geochemical characteristic of all island arcs. Why don't we read what this means? This is a slide I'm putting in just to amuse myself because it's, uh, I'm very proud of it actually. It's uh, the Maracaibo Basin. Here's the Maracaibo Basin of Western Venezuela and the Barbados Ridge, which is up here out in the Atlantic Ocean, so it should be oceanic crust. The Maracaibo Basin, they would have Eocene sediments on top of a, a clearly identifiable a seismic marker, which is the Cretaceous La Luna source rock, which made Venezuela the richest country in the world for petroleum. If we take this, this panel and transcribe it to this section over Barbados, I think you'd agree that that's pretty astounding. And if I tell you that oil on Barbados has the same chemistry as the Maracaibo oil, then we have a question to ask. And it's very important for Caribbean geology. And we have to ask, why is the geology here the same as all the way up here? What's lying out there remaining to be discovered? Back to those Pacific volcanic arcs. These are accreted volcanic arcs that's due to strike slip along the margins of the Western margins of the Americas. But over here, we have rifted continental elements which are being dispersed towards the east. And they are actively overriding adjacent plates. So I'm saying that this is the, the active process. Subduction is secondary. And so I have a question, is subduction active or passive? And I know what I think. 
So I defined, I wrote this uh, in 2018, intra-oceanic arcs There is no andesite problem and subduction factories do not exist. That's got rid of two problems. Lateral faults, strike slip, displacement over thousands of kilometers possible. The most important faults, they can generate most structures. If we look here at a stress strain diagram, this is a dextral offset uh, fault. It can generate synthetic faults, antithetic faults, extensional faults and compression and thrust faults and folds. So wrench faults can generate everything else that we see on the on the crust of the earth. We have basins which uh, involve subsidence and uh, uplift which involves the inversion of those basins and strain migrates along the fault. We have basins first, we have it uplifts next. Coming close towards the end now, we're looking at high pressure, low temperature rocks. High pressure, low temperature, blue schist and eclogites. This blue schist, beautiful rock, is uh, eclogite in marble. And they are thought to form in and to record subduction zones where they descend to 80 to 100 kilometers where I would point out that we're talking about near 3000 degrees centigrade, and I don't think that's exactly low temperature. And then they return to the surface via an unknown mechanism. But when we look at these, these rocks, the fossil and metamorphic age of the rocks, is they are similar. Metamorphic degree increases towards the faults. I want to look again at my one of my favorite parts of the world, Colombia, Venezuela, Trinidad. It's a zone of dextral plate displacement. And it is a fascinating active natural geological laboratory. Here's a gravity anomaly map over Venezuela. You can see the Maracaibo, Lake Maracaibo here, Trinidad's lying over here. And here is this fantastic gravity anomaly. The basins contain a huge amount of very young sediments. They're going down like an, like an express elevator and they have low temperature flux, low heat flux. And they are sites for conditions of blue schist and eclodite condition, high pressure. The high pressures are, from, are known from uh, oil wells. And those same rocks crop out here in the uplift, it's the uplift of a precursor basin. These basins are migrating in this direction. But over here we have this fantastic situation. This mountain with a fantastic relief at the coast is the largest ocean side mountain in the earth. So we have in this diagram a route without a mountain. And here we have a mountain without a root. So what does this tell us about mountain generation? Look at a, a cross section here. It's one I made uh, about 35 years ago. And we see the basin, which is going underneath the uplift, which is approaching. So this is a mountain which is beginning to override its basin. So how do mountains form? According to the USGS, according to plate tectonics, they form by collision and they have roots. But Molnar wrote, and Meissner wrote, Where did the roots of these, these ancient mountains go? The, because of metamorphic accommodation to pressure and temperature, the moho rides upwards and uh, becomes horizontal. Here's the 
a, a formation of the Alps by I India, which has migrated something like 9,000 kilometers from the south. And it pushed up the Himalayas. The problem is the fossils are the same as India. India has always been related to Asia. So sorry, don't agree with the with the model. And Noah made a very interesting observation. Mountain belts exist this where no continent collision occurred. But let's turn back to the uh, to the how did mountains form? Basins formed first, as I showed you in the Venezuelan example. They become inverted and carry with them their metamorphosed rocks and the uplifts lip override the basins. So this is a dynamic evolution of mountains. It's not just lateral compression. We know these two familiar models for mountains, explanation of mountains, the Pratt model and the Airy model. And you might like to think about how, which one of those you'd still bet on after having seen what I showed, if you believe what I showed. The plate tectonic paradigm is the unifying theory of geology, wonderful. So I have a definition of a, a tectonic plate. It's a polygonal entity defined by major boundaries. The crust is extended continent to extended continent. And the boundaries are extensional, convergent, or transgressive. According to Britannica, plate tectonics was a true scientific revolution, and analogous to quantum mechanics or genetic code. Whereas this author wrote something different. And uh, of course, I obviously agree with him, but I would also add the Big Bang Theory. And that's my presentation. So it's time for questions. Thank you very much, Keith. You've uh, certainly covered a huge amount of material. And I think uh, everybody with interest in any uh, particular part of Earth sciences would find something to say about this. That was a, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but it's a, uh feel like I've had the sort of the rug taken completely from underneath me. It, you know, I'm not complaining. That's quite an extraordinary uh, shock to the system. <laughs> Good. Because <laughs> I remember thinking when we were at the lecture committee, you know, we all know what we all know, you know, whatever else amateur geologists know, we all know about the bit, you know, about, about plate tectonics. We've all read the books, but this is, um, I have to go, I, I mean, I just go away and clear my head i think where do you start i mean this is quite an extraordinary transformation i mean i really don't feel competent even to ask a question i'm really glad actually we've recorded this because i'm going to sort of thought the whole thing again to digest it there's a question from matt terry saying the numbers on the gravity map could you just clarify the minus and plus what do they represent the gravity measurements they're measured in reference to a zero line so if you have positive gravity you would generally say you have a, a high density body and if you have negative gravity values you have a, a missing mass so we see in the venezuelan case the negative gravity over that basin it the largest negative gravity tells you've got you've got a huge hole in the earth's crust mm -hmm. is there a some sort of point on the point on the earth which is taken as the sort of standard 
you know, against which these are measured? Is there some point? Uh, I mean, I've, you know, we learned about gravity at school, but if if there's a positive and a negative, is it, is there some international? I'm sure. I'm sure there is. Know? I don't know where it is. <laughs> it's not in Aberystwyth. <laughs> I've got one observation or one query. Um, you talked about the source rock, La Luna source rock, and how the geology matched in uh, northern Venezuela, I think it was. And I was just thinking, in terms of source rocks, they've traditionally been described as related to sea level, and you get source rocks formed globally related to sea level in all environments, you know, up continental or deep sea, that there are, there are mechanisms described to form source rocks at the same age at sea level high stand across continents and in the deep sea. And then my question to you was, I've missed the point that you were trying to make about the lowest form of entropy in hexagons, which was fantastic, with how it relates back to your theory of the expanding Earth, basically. Can you relate the hexagons, the lowest form of entropy, to the patterns that you're seeing in the way that the Earth is fracturing? Yes, I think my big point is to say, you have a, an austere body such as the United States Geological Survey, and they are defining for us in today's age, they're saying that plates are irregularly shaped, and they're not. If you look at the information that I showed, there is a definite hexagonal pattern common to nature and certainly common to geology. Plates, the, 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 the structure of the Earth's crust is polygonal. My understanding would be that when Earth's crust first consolidated, it used its uh, the entropy, as you describe it, to form itself into use as least energy as possible, and it formed hexagonal plates. And those are they are common of the worst. The Earth's crust is is broken up into hexa hexagons of all sorts of different dimensions. What I call fractal geology. I'm not sure if I open. Am I answering your question? Yeah, absolutely. I've seen it I've mapped in the Gulf of Suez. I've looked at the Atlantic margin and it's definitely, you have zones, hinge zones, you know, where the faults are dipping in the opposite directions and things. It is absolutely, as you've said, very interesting about your thinned crust along the edges of the Atlantic margin and the fact that there are very ancient rocks in that, considering we would think, expect it to be fairly recent crust and so on. I thought your observations were amazing. You, you've basically looked at everything with very fresh eyes. Yeah, I'm absolutely reeling. <laughs> oh, good. I think we have a fundamental problem, a fundamental challenge. We need to decide what is oceanic crust. The Russians talked about this many years ago. We talk about the oceanic crust and we say it's built of basalt. And I showed you DSTB tests of that, and it's not necessarily basalt. It could be looking at the, um, the amount of continental crust that is found in the ocean, extended continent, hyperextended continental crust. I'm inclined to believe that, um, no, I shouldn't use belief, I suggest that we should look at continent being stretched, stretched, stretched way out as far as the spreading ridges, and we will still find stretched continent. I question what we think about as ocean. I'm just working on Indonesia at the moment, and the, the, the area between the collision of the Philippines plate and the Eurasian plate is exactly as you said, and the gravity modelling there is, they talk about a melange of continental and oceanic crust in that region there. There's some new work on that area. I mean, they talk about as slivers off the Australia and things like that, but it is actually in a transform zone. It's in a dextral shear zone, sorry, probably a sinistral shear zone, exactly as you've described, with a very mixed gravity anomaly. The gravity anomalies are difficult to, to understand because mm -hmm. they're, they're neither one or the other. They don't, they don't fit anything. And your rootless mountains, I've just, I gave some talks recently on the west coast of America and nobody has a theory as to how the Rockies formed. There's no, you know, people have, it's, it's very difficult to understand how they formed. I'm surprised, sorry to interrupt, but I'm surprised that we have such a situation in North America with all the geologists they yeah. have there and they yeah. still haven't figured it out. But that yeah. stuff came 
that stuff came from the Pacific. It's been accreted by strike slip along things like the uh, the San Andreas. Yeah. The same is of the, the South America. If you go to the Andes in Peru and you walk over the rocks there, you find Triassic basins which formed and they be they formed in the Pacific and they've been thrust up onto uh, South America and that's how the Andes formed. And as the crust thickens, then you have uh, melting and you have uh, the, uh, some, one of the most prolific volcanic zones in the world. So your paper, you've got one out this year. Which paper? <laughs> you, you had James 2023. Oh, this is, no, this is just putting the date on this presentation. I'm actually trying to write a book on the geology of middle America, but it's a, it's a long shot. I'm very appreciative. I'm very encouraged by your response, that both of you who have responded, to, to say that it's the positive responses. And I hope that maybe we can use this presentation as recording and uh, recorded and spread the word. I mean, I've just read a book, this book by, it was published by the Geological Society of London, 50 Years of the Wilson Cycle Concept. I read it, I go out for a pint every night and I read the, the book. I have to read it, I have to reread it, and I have to go back for another pint, which is positive. But anyway, it's one of the most difficult books that I have ever read, and I am surprised that, to see that it's published by the Geological Society of London. Oh, well, uh, I don't feel quite so bad at, uh, at wrestling with the concepts we've been presented with today. There is another question from Andrew, which um, I'll just read out. Has the expansion of the Earth by the solar wind charged particles been modelled and agree with what you have shown today? Uh, I don't know that it has been modelled. I'm just saying that the, um, the European Space Agency put the satellites, there are four satellites up there, they've been up there for 20 years, they've gathered all this information, there's a huge amount of material that's coming our way from the Sun, it's being focused into the Earth and over hundreds of millions of years, the Earth has to grow. It includes not only electrons and protons, but also elements such as iron, which are quite dense. But there was a paper, a different paper by some Japanese scientists who used satellite data to examine the Earth over a period of 20 years, and they concluded that the Earth is expanding as well. But two uh, lines of, of evidence to say that the Earth is expanding. I actually came up with that idea when I was in Venezuela in the 80s and I thought I was isolated there and I thought I'm brilliant I've come up with this wonderful idea and I came back to Europe and found found that many other people thought of the <laughs> same thing. So. Truly great minds. Following on, actually, related to that, Bob Burrell, um, again, is asking, is there any way of demonstrating that the density of the Earth has been reduced over the years? It has been expanding. The density, let's see, we're increasing the mass, so the volume must increase. Uh, how does that appear in density? I don't think, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought the density, the density is, is, a, is a different subject. I don't know the answer to your question. I, I don't, I've never thought about the density of the Earth. I would have thought that a, a larger volume with the same mass must be a lighter density. No, the mass increases and the volume increases. How does the mass, how does the weight of the Earth increase? The mass increases because of this uh, one mechanism is to say that this it's being added to by the, the solar wind the stuff that's being sent our way from the from the sun and so the mass of the earth increases and if mass increases volume has to increase okay so there's a there have been arguments <laughs> about not arguments the theory of ridge push versus um slab descent and increase in density you know, the mechanisms of subduction have not been at all satisfying have they over the years no the, the mechanisms of plate motion has not been worked out over the years i think we have as i said right at the beginning we have a wonderful collection in textbooks and youtube lectures which haven't been modified in 55 years and it's about time and i would like to see a, a big challenge put out there 
when I went to a conference in London in 2018, and they were still talking about the same stuff, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but they were still congratulating themselves on what they had talked about uh, 55 years ago. When I was uh, much younger and uh, I uh, studied uh, geology, I was given this uh, theory that the, there were two plates, namely Avalonia and Laurentia. And paleontological evidence showed that before the two plates came together, there was biological diversity between, say, Laurentia and Avalonia. And then as time went on, this, bio, uh, this uh, biological diversity regarding uh, certain fossils became reduced as time went on. And that was one of the theories that supported the classic plate tectonic theory. Trilobites, for instance, there was a diversity of trilobites and the diversity reduced as geological time went on. I was just wondering if you had any views on the diversity, original diversity that existed and this diversity became reduced as the two plates came together. I don't know the answer to your question. I have read papers. I've been puzzled by them. There's in this book, which I showed you, it's a Geological Society Special Publication 470. Buy it if you've got nothing better to spend your money on. <laughs> and I don't wish to be disrespectful. There's a paper in it that titled The Classic Wilson Cycle Revisited. And they discuss with much better authority and, and wisdom than I have the, the question that you're asking. Paleontological diversity becomes reduced as the two continents come together. Uh, I, I, mean, I don't know the explanation. I've read papers and I haven't been inspired to think about why. <laughs> that was a theory that existed around about 1978, you know. Do you have any uh, publications we can look at? Uh, look up any of you, anything that you've published with your thoughts or your ideas? Oh, I'm I'm on ResearchGate. I don't know if you do you know ResearchGate. Yeah, yeah, I'm on that too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have uh, all my papers of the past twenty years are on that. Uh, they're accessible through ResearchGate. Okay, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm very pleased to say that my weekly statistics show my research impact is in the top 4% according to ResearchGate, but I don't know how much confidence we should have in ResearchGate. It's well used, well used globally. I would be very proud of that. <laughs> I, am, I am proud of it. I am surprised. But... Right, there's just a very final comment. Then. Dixon has written, simply written, what next or next research steps? That's a very good question, uh, and uh, one should always look, look at, at what's next. I think uh, what I would like to see is people considering the questions that I have raised, and some of them will shoot me down with no problem, I'm sure. But I would like the world, the geological community, to, to think about where they are in, in their understanding and, and maybe addressing some of these problems and writing up-to-date textbooks. That's what's next. Well, that seems uh, enough to be going on with. I, I, on behalf of, of, of the society, and I'm sure everybody here this evening, I want to thank you for a, really, a, it still remains a, a stunning presentation. The, the, the issues to take away and reflect on, I think this evening uh, will rumble on for a long time. Julian, if I could hand over to you to, to say a final thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. <clears throat> no, it, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, it sounds so like you're a smash hit, Keith, as I always expected. I think uh, you don't need me to uh, say any more words. I think the uh, tremendous reaction from the audience and the tsunami of questions and the obvious uh, intrigue that you've generated is, uh, speaks for itself. So I'm very much encouraged. Mm -hmm. so thank you for all, all for being so, impo uh, so positive. Yeah. And can I say thank you for allowing us to, to re record the lecture. Um, it, it will actually be our first, if and as and when it's posted wherever, and I will keep members informed. But it's a, it's a hell of a one to start with. 
<laughs> I, I actually wonder if I could put that on, if it, if you have a recording, uh, if I'd like to put it on YouTube. And Because I tell you one thing, if you have the views that I have, you will never get them published. Oh. <laughs> I, I, can, I have a long list of, of papers that have been rejected by learned people for the wrong reasons quite often. Yeah, so putting it on YouTube would be wonderful. Uh, well, um, I, I guess at that juncture we should say, um, you know, leave that to to us and to Gillian. Yeah, do it, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, I think it's time for us to say good night. Thank you very much again, uh, Dr. James.